Okay, catch up. What's going on here in Genesis 47? Remember, in this passage, uh, some people take this as like supporting some kind of communist welfare setup. Now, there is some form of welfare setup, but it's not the way that you would, uh, that you would think Americans are doing today. Okay? So it's no, no means that way. Nowhere close to that. Let's look at Genesis chapter 47. Let me keep reading and explaining, and then we'll expound the flaws to a communist setup that you would see in this passage when it's not. Verse 22, Only the land of the priests bought he not, for the priests had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh, and did eat their portion which Pharaoh gave them. Wherefore, they sold not their lands. So it's only the land of the Egyptian priests that Joseph did not buy. He left those lands alone. Remember, he bought the properties of all the other people who were starving. And those people who are starving want to sell their land so that they could uh, have an exchange for uh, seed in order to uh, plant food. Anyway, uh, the portion of land was assigned to the priests by Pharaoh. That's what verse 22 is pointing out. That's why Joseph couldn't touch it. And the priests also ate their own portion from Pharaoh. So that's why the priests were saying, hey, we don't have to sell our lands. We're already taken care of. We have our property. We have our food. Verse 23, Then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. Lo, here is seed for you, and ye shall sow the land. So Joseph says to the people, Hey, so remember, behold is that word that means pay attention or hey, or look. I bought, uh, today I bought you your land, and that now goes to Pharaoh. So here's seed for you. So he's giving them seed for grain, for bread. And you're going to use this to sow throughout the land, and you can grow your own food. All right, now, if some of you are thinking that I'm being a little bit filler mode or redundant, what I'm trying to do is explaining every word in that verse. So that way you don't feel bored or feel like that I'm doing a filler. Look at that verse while I'm explaining a verse. When you do that, uh, you're going to understand. The goal, remember, of this verse-by-verse -verse Bible study is not for you just to know stuff in the verses, but actually every single word in the verse. That's the goal of this Bible study. Uh, that's the intention, okay? So make sure you do that. All right, verse 24. And it shall come to pass in the increase that ye shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh, and four parts shall be your own for seed of the field and for your food and for them of your households and for food for your little ones. So Joseph, he says to the people, so it's just going to so happen, that's what and it shall come to pass is referring to, that when your food increases, that's the idea, in the increase, you're going to make sure you're going to give the fifth of, of that to Pharaoh. And then the other four parts, that's going to be your own. The, that's concerning the seed of the field, the food, and those that... Uh, for them of your households and for food for your little ones. So it's referring to uh, the, the food and then I'm assuming the land of their households and their children. Verse 25, and they said, thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord and we will be Pharaoh's servants. So then the people are so gracious that they say to uh, Joseph, hey, you saved our lives. Uh, let us find grace in the sight of my Lord is a common phrase that they use for royalty that, hey, let, if, it, if it can please you, I hope that you can uh, give us, bestow us the honor if it pleases you or basically if you see it that way, that we will be Pharaoh's servant. We're going to serve Pharaoh. Verse 26, uh, and Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt unto this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth part except the land of the priests only, which became not Pharaoh. So Joseph made a decree or a law throughout the entire land of Egypt up to this day. So uh, it could mean two ways. It could mean that during, uh, it could be referring to Joseph's time during all of his lifetime, it was a law 
from Genesis 47 to the entirety of his lifetime that they have that law, or since Moses is the author, it's from Genesis 47 all the way to Moses when he was currently writing Genesis. So that has always been the law, that the fifth part goes to Pharaoh. So basically that's what verse 26 said, but the only exception is the priest's property. That didn't belong to Pharaoh. All right, now there are uh, several things to notice right here in Genesis chapter 47 concerning about Joseph's deal. And then we're going to later talk about his uh, two sons. So the first flaw is this. The first flaw is when you look at verse, as I mentioned in our last Genesis study, verse 21, some of those uh, communists, yeah, I don't care about semantics, you know, uh, they're communists, all right? Well, you get in current government are communists, all right? I don't care what you say, all right? So your current communists will try to say that this is referring to people being moved to different locations. So they don't have a freedom of their own property. They don't have rights to their property. They were forcibly removed from their place into uh, different locations so that they can serve Pharaoh. And the reason why is because of the statement that was given at verse 18. The Egyptian says, we're going to sell our own body and our land to you. And then verse 25, the people said, we will be Pharaoh's servant. Now, you know what the huge flaw to that one is? Here's a huge flaw to that one that people uh, don't pay attention to. One is, notice that it's not a mandatory restriction. Can I repeat that again? On the past stinking years that you've heard, okay? It's not a mandatory restriction. That's a huge flaw to this system. All right, communists, they forcibly make everything. Yeah. Just like, um, <laughs> okay, yeah. which I can't say, all right? Yeah. So that's what's been going on. This is totally different from how the current countries run, right? right. Western freedom of speech countries, yeah. my foot, yeah. So this is very different. These people are offering. So notice this is a capitalism setup, mm -hmm. but it's not in monetary figures. It's in different setups. So this is more of a capitalism setup. Secondly, uh, these people, when they uh, were offering themselves, they insisted to serve Joseph. Joseph never, there is no verse here that points out, uh, I mean, like, look at verse 26. Joseph did not make it a law that they would become slaves or servants. Do you see that? Do you also see that uh, in verse 20, after verse 19, they, uh, verse 18, 19, the people said, we will sell ourselves, whatever, become servants of Pharaoh. Verse 20, Joseph uh, didn't make them slaves. He didn't do that. What did he do? He was only interested in buying their property because you need some kind of uh, exchange, some substance that has proper exchange. That's all he did. All he did was buy their property. This is a capitalism setup, not a communist setup. Secondly, these people were offering their service to become slaves. And notice right here, Joseph, uh, there is no record here, Joseph did that to them. So what is this? This is not people being forced to become slaves. These are people so gracious of the treatment that their government leader was treating them that they're like, man, I'll serve you forever. Now, if you want to have good civil servants in this country, why don't you do your stinking job? Imagine having a bunch of people saying, man, uh, I trust you, man. I'll, I'll be a good citizen. I'll serve the best that I can and do that and that and that. You want that kind of setup? Why don't you be a good leader? You know, that's why there's a lot. I'm, why don't churches have that either, right? Yeah, you get dictators in churches, dictators in governments, you get dictators in basically any position of power. It's called being flesh. It's called being flesh. So if you want loyalty, if you want people who can serve you 
and etc., then do your stinking job as a leader. Simple, all right? Yeah. Treat them very well that they'll, they'll even say that to you. Yeah. You don't have to say that to them. Right, right, right. You don't really have to say that to them. Okay, but they have to make you, right? They have to tell you. They have to keep forcing you. It shows the hearts of these wicked people. Okay. Right. Now, so fault one. Okay, let's write these faults here. Notice right here, it's a capitalism setup. It's not a communist setup. Secondly, we see right here that there is no record of Joseph making them slaves. Even if he did, so I'll grant the possibility, but I doubt it, but even if he did, there is no record of that. It's the people who are happy with the treatment that they can trust the leader that they offered to serve them. It's called voluntary. What's that? Voluntary. Yeah. That's not mandatory. Yeah. Right. All right? It's a voluntary setup. Why? Because people uh, appreciate how well you treat them, so then they do it in return. Yeah. But uh, today's voluntary service is pretty much stink, don't you think so? Yeah. yeah, today's voluntary service is pretty much stink. The reason why is because people are so fleshly nowadays, and leaders are too uh, abusive. There's your simple answer. Now, uh, concerning this uh, so-called communist setup, there's a, another flaw right here. Another flaw is when Joseph uh, moved them to different locations, he wasn't doing that so that he can put them in a particular location where he can keep track of them and then they can be proper civil servants of the government like current <laughs> governments are trying to do to you. I don't know if you're enjoying I'm enjoying this, all right? I'm enjoying myself, all right? So I'm enjoying myself right now. So, so you notice right here that the reason why Joseph moved them is so that it's not to track them. It's not so that they become civil servants. He's putting them in good properties over there, good portions where there's food, where they can have good economic access and et cetera. Because their, their current land is what? Desolate. Yeah. They have no seed, so he has to move them. <laughs> All right, so that's number three. If I can write all this now while I'm talking. And then uh, the next uh, fault right here. Let's see. I had a lot of faults right here. Lots and lots of faults right here. So let me wrap it up with just a few more, though. Oh, uh, here's another one why it's not a communist setup. You ready? All right. Uh, this is eye-opening, eye, eye all right? Shocking, okay? Watch this now. You ready? The, gu the guy in charge was a say believer. Why don't you put uh, say believers in charge? Okay. Let's see what's going to happen, right? Instead of corrupted officials, yeah. unsaved people, and atheists. Uh, look at the fruits of communism with the atheist setup. Sure doing really great, right? Yeah. All right, so have a say believer in charge. So yeah, it, you could say probably right here that it may be where a leader is in charge and uh, controlling all of this kind of stuff, and then people uh, selling all this kind of stuff, but they're entrusting it to a say believer. So that's still different from a communist setup right here. <laughs> How funny. Okay. All right. So it's a saved believers in charge, all right? Saved believers in charge. That's one. Number two, it is a capitalism setup. There's an exchange of goods right here. It's nothing forced. Three, it's completely voluntary, not mandatory. Four, there's no record. Of becoming slaves. Fifthly, This uh, moving to different cities, being assigned to cities, oh, excuse me, uh, yeah, 
had to do so that they can be in a good area where they can get food. Not forcible service. For food, not slavery. So, notice there's already way too many flaws. Sixthly, oh, you're going to love this one. You ready for this one? All right, the government's going to really like this one. So, notice right here that it says uh, a fifth part unto Pharaoh, and then four parts uh, shall be your own. Now, okay, see, you know, some of you already got that. Okay. Now, the excuse with these communist leaders nowadays is that when you make more money, it doesn't make more sense that really rich people should pay higher taxes, you know? That's their logic. But you got to realize this. Some of those stinking rich people, that's like literally pocket change to them. And then, you, uh, and then how they're trying to think about, you know, the poorer class, the poorer class, so then you make them tax less. Then the middle is still suffering way too much. So, you know what you should do? Here's the sixth thing. So it'll be a combination, that way they can understand this. It's a taxation setup where it's like a 20% combined, because some people get paid a lot more than that now, and it will get higher, all right? Yep. Just, just, just wait, what you're paying, it's gonna get higher eventually. Where you get 20% tax, but it's combined, notice right here, where all these people start at an equal level. You notice that? All these people are working for their own uh, food and everything. So because of that, no one can give the excuse, well, you know, because I'm not as privileged. Or because I'm a victim of this. Here's the, here's the best one, you know. Because I'm not white, I deserve more, okay. Yeah. Now, uh, anyone can play the victim now. This one doesn't work. He gave you seed. It's up to you. You starve yourself to death or you work for your own food. Yeah. All right? So what he was giving was when there's tax, it's job opportunities. You see that? It's not handouts. It's tax combined with job opportunities. He gave them a job. Here's seed. You plant it yourself. And then whatever you make from your work, you give that part, that's tax, to Pharaoh. He didn't give them a little welfare check thing and then tax them high, and then the money and the economy is all falling apart. Right. Now, I don't have a... a con uh, Econ I don't have a degree in economics, but any fool can figure that out from reading the text. All right, go to chapter 47, verse 27. Okay. Chapter 47, verse 27. There's like, uh, I think it goes from 10%, then 20, 30, 40, 50. I mean, it's getting higher. So there are a lot of people who's getting that in different ranges. It's such a mess nowadays. All right, uh, Genesis chapter 47, and then verse 27. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt in the country of Goshen, and they had possessions therein and grew and multiplied exceedingly. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the whole age of Jacob was 140 and 7 years. So uh, meaning, every word in the verse is that Israel lived in the land of Egypt, and the particular region is Goshen in Egypt. So... Israel and his children, they had a lot of possessions in there. That's what therein is. They, and then it grew, multiplied exceedingly. It increased their riches. Verse 28. And Jacob, uh, Jacob, he lived 17 years in Egypt. So Jacob's entire total age would be 147 years old. 29, and the time drew nigh that Israel must die. And he called his son Joseph and said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. So the time was coming very close for him to die, for Israel. That's Joseph, uh, Jacob's other name. So he summoned his son Joseph, and then he said the following words, if I have found grace in thy sight, so if there's something that I do where I can uh, gain some privilege, if I've done anything pleasing to you, then 
I want you, I beseech you, uh, I ask you, that's what I pray they mean. It's a request to put the hand under my thigh. So Jacob, uh, not Jacob, Joseph put his hand uh, below uh, Jacob's thigh. So it, it means usually, it's, this is usually called the thigh, and there's a thigh bone over here, right? So then it's right here. Some people put it at a grotesque area like they did at Genesis 24, but no, that's not what it means. Because this is the strength uh, of a man. The Bible says the strength of a man is in his legs, right? That's where he gets uh, his increase of aggression and everything. It's located within that region. A lot of people exercise that area deliberately so that uh, they can uh, gain more strength and energy. So the Bible also talks about the strength of a man is in his legs, actually. Anyway, so because that's where all the strength is, J Jacob wants Joseph to make a promise. So then he puts his hand on the strongest part of Jacob's body, so to speak. And then Jacob says, I want you to treat me kindly and treat me very well, truly with me. That's the idea. Don't bury me, I ask you, in Egypt. That's what Jacob asked. Jacob asked Joseph, I do not want to be buried in here. I want to be buried uh, outside of here. So it is common sense knowledge ever since the beginning of Genesis to stay away from Egypt. Egypt is a bad place. Only people who don't know that are Alexandrian scholars who found manuscripts over there. They always have an infatuation with Egypt. They always go there. Verse 30, But I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt, and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. And he said, Swear unto me, and he swear unto him. And Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. Okay, meaning right here that uh, Jacob's continuing on his speech, I'm going to lie with my fathers. I want to be buried where they're buried. And you're going to carry me out of Egypt. You're going to bury me at the burying place of my other forefathers, so Isaac and Abraham. Uh, Joseph responds, I will do everything that you told me. And Jacob says, I want you to swear it. And uh, Joseph says, I swear it to you. And then Israel, uh, Israel, then he bowed himself upon the bed's head. So meaning right here, we have to understand this. Uh, go to Genesis 24. I'll explain that phrase after I critique first. So the, criticism, the thing that I got to critique are the critics. There are critics who are critiquing this verse and think that's an error in your Bible. So then... Uh, I'm going to critique them in return. The idea is this, is that Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. So then uh, the scholars, they look that up, and then they compare that with Hebrews chapter 11. So you go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. The question here is, did, is, did Israel bow on his staff or bed? Now, obviously, I believe the Bible, not the scholars. So then if the Bible says bed, it's bed. And then the scholar says, no, it's staff. So they look at the Hebrew word, and then they assume that the Hebrew writers, they made a scribal error of like one letter or something. And then because they changed that letter, I forgot what it was, Mecca or Maka or something like that, Miva, something like that. But just one little uh, letter in the Hebrew uh, word, they assume the scribes are falling asleep, or they uh, misworded it, or it's, uh, you know, they wrote it in a way where anyone would misunderstand it to be a different word, etc. All right? Just like 1 Timothy 3.16, they do that. That's why they put heat, because of a certain little syllable or word missing, you know. They always have uh, their excuses, all right? Don't matter, okay? Point is, is that because of that, they, uh, the writer must have meant staff, not bed. No. God says bed. We choose that way, all right? So let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. This is their passage that they use. When Israel was dying, or Jacob was dying, he used his staff uh, to bless the children. And this was when he was dying. So let's look at the book of Hebrews, and then chapter 11, verse 21. By faith, Jacob... When he was a dying, 
blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. So notice right here, he's like leaning on the staff. So they're assuming he bowed on his staff. All right. There's a problem with this. Several problems. Too many uh, issues with this one. One is, uh, the verse said he was leaning on his staff. Why? It's so easy, man. He's up in years. He's dying. All right? Who wouldn't lean on his staff? It's not that he was bowing on the staff and then giving some kind of blessing. No, that's pagan. Yeah. Look at Hosea 4. Hosea 4. You know some churches and religions, how they make a big deal about staffs and, you know, it's such a religious rod or something like that, and they'll pray over it thinking that it has some kind of magic or lucky charm. They think that Jacob was doing something like that. They're giving that kind of impression. Go to the book of Hosea, chapter 4. He don't need his staff, all right, to give a blessing to people. As a matter of fact, we're going to see that later on when he blesses uh, Joseph's two sons. Yep. All right, let's look at the book of Hosea, chapter 4. Notice what the Lord thinks about that, using a staff for purposes like that. Uh, Hosea, chapter 4, and then verse, uh, let's see here, yada, 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 yada. Verse 12, my people ask counsel at their stocks, and their staff declareth unto them. For the spirit of whoredoms hath caused them to err, and they have gone a whoring from under their God. They sacrifice on the top of the mountains and burn incense upon the hills under oaks and poplars and elms. Okay, so notice right here, this is all referring to idolatry, yep. paganism right here. And then when the Bible mentions about uh, verse 12, their staff, in context with the idolatry, tied to the idolatry right here. It's not a, it's not a positive reference. Yep. It's a negative reference. Right. All right, another thing is when you, they didn't really read Hebrews 11, all right? This incident when he was dying was when he blessed the two sons of Joseph, right. okay? So fault one is it's paganism. In Hosea 4. Second problem. It said he was uh, leaning on the staff. He wasn't bowing on it. Why? Because he's up in years. That's just common sense, all right? <laughs> yeah. So when he was bowing from Genesis 47 that we read, it must be a different situation. It's not the same as Hebrews 11. So then, number three, this incident is when he blessed uh, Joseph's two sons. Genesis 47 had to do where he wanted to be buried. It's a request for burial. The request for burial is a different incident for, from the blessing. The blessing is the next chapter. I don't know. Were they reading the next chapter? I don't know what they were doing, man. So we'll get to the next chapter soon. Another thing, it's pretty obvious that he bowed on uh, the bed. Because why? If we go back here, uh, let's look at context. Let's look at context of Genesis chapter 47. When we look at Genesis chapter 47... Jacob, uh, use your common sense. In verse 29, 30, and 31, he's dying, right? So his time of death is coming near. So if his time of death is drawing near, you think he's going to be sitting on a chair or lying down on a bed? Most likely lying down on a bed, right? So if he's lying down on a bed, and then he gets up to talk to Joseph, remember he said, put your hand on my thigh, right? under my thigh, so he's getting up right here. So if he gets up, and then Joseph puts a hand on the thigh, he says, swear to me, and then Joseph's like, I swear it, I swear it. And then Jacob's like, okay, and then, so then he's going like this. So then see, he's bowing toward the direction where the bed's head at, is at the pillow. So he's going like, Ugh, and then he relaxes. <laughs> it's just that simple. I don't know what they were doing. Notice right here that in verse two, 
See, like just two verses after this. Chapter 48, verse 2. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son uh, Joseph cometh unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the what? Bed. He was at the bed that whole time. What are the scholars doing? No, they're not helping out God. All right? I mean, it's so funny. They don't even go by the Hebrew that they claim. They claim that the Hebrew writers made a scribal error themselves. So notice right here, these scholars are lying through their teeth when they try to tell you that we're just trying to go by what the original Hebrew is. No, they don't even go by the original Hebrew. What they mean by original Hebrew is their original Hebrew that they fantasized in their minds that, oh, the scribe must have made an error. The original Hebrew must mean this. What original Hebrew? You don't even have the substance. You just made it up in your head. So notice, scholars' final authority is not the Bible. It's never the Bible. It's always themselves. Trustworthy now. You can trust those people. <laughs> no. One thing I learned is I don't care how smart you are. You should not trust your own brain. When you get old, that pride's going to get to you. I'm so smart. I had so many degrees. And, and when you get old and then your health is failing and your brain is falling apart, and then people hear you out and you say, no, I'm smart. You should listen to me. But you talk nonsensical. Those people will see that except you. Because you're too smart for yourself. That, what the Bible calls that, wise in your own conceits. Yes, yes. All right, uh, let's look at uh, chapter 47 and verse 31. So, Israel bowed himself upon the bed, says, there's a final thing to prove this. Genesis 24. Look, why? Think about this. Why is Jacob telling uh, Joseph to put his hand on his thigh unless he's repeating something that his forefathers did. It's a practice. Let's look back at Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24. Verse 2. Genesis 24, verse 2. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house, that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear... Isn't that what Jacob did? Yeah, Jacob did that. That's why in verse 1, notice right here, Abraham's old and well-stricken in age, just like Jacob. He's uh, getting older and older. So we see right here that uh, Jacob is repeating uh, the incident, the same thing with Abraham. Do you really think Abraham was taking out his staff right here and then, you know, bowing down on it and then... Do, uh, you know, giving some, bestowing some kind of blessing due to this lucky charm that he's holding in his hand. No, it's pretty obvious he's in bed. Yep. He's in bed. So Jacob is just simply repeating uh, what his forefathers did back then. Okay, so we're going to uh, go back to Genesis chapter 47. Genesis chapter 47. Verse uh, 31, which I already read, so I will finish off in chapter 48. We're going to read that one. And it came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. So, uh, and it came to pass, this is the phrase meaning it just so happened, uh, after everything that occurred, after these things. So, notice right here, it's after the incident of chapter 47, verse 27 through 31, right? So it's after that, all those incidents, that a person told Joseph, hey, your father is actually very ill. So then Joseph uh, took his two boys, Manasseh and Ephraim, with him because he wants to get the blessing from his father for his two boys. That's why he brought them over. Now, uh, supposedly this is a contradiction in your King James Bible. Well, uh, I say again, obviously not, all right? That's not a contradiction. Uh, people can be so nitpicky with your book, right? I think it's because they're tired with the book being nitpicky with them. They don't like the book judging them. So then they make it their whole life always judging that book. Anyway, when we come to right here, this is supposedly a contradiction. No, the contradiction is easily answered here. They think that in chapter 47... Jacob's about to die, and when he bowed his head on his bed, that's when he died. And then chapter 48, oh, guess what? He came back to life, you know? Now, 
Oh my goodness. So these guys, if they insist that they major in Hebrew and historical sources and blah, 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 they know seven languages, they better soon know their English before they do this. Right. Yeah. You know why? You think the author is so stupid after he wrote verse 31, oh, Israel died, and then chapter 48, verse 1, it came to pass after these things. Where were you, scholar, PhD buddy you? You know what that is? That's deliberately trying to find an error. That's not, they're not being honest. That's evidence that's not being honest. That's deliberately trying to find an error. That's being nitpicky. So the author knows that, uh, that Jacob didn't die at verse 31. Why? He never said he died. Okay? It's just talking about at verse 29. It never said that Israel uh, is dying or that, uh, well, not that Israel is dying, but that he died right here. It's talking about his time of death is drawing nearer. So for all we knew, know, it could last for another day, two more days, a week. But that much time is enough for chapter 48 and verse 1 to happen. All right, that never happened to you in the hospital, you know? Your loved one is about to die, and then you left. But that wasn't the day that they died. You heard news later on, hey, uh, your father is real sick, you better get over here. And then you go over there? That ain't a contradiction. I mean, they don't, they got to know, they got to major in common sense in English before they, they start learning Hebrew, A, B, C, and D. <laughs> All right, so when we go to chapter 48, I know Hebrew don't have A, B, C, and D. I know, I know. I know what you're thinking. All right, don't be, don't be so nitpicky. I'm just being sarcastic, okay? It's called sarcasm, all right? <laughs> don't be too smart that you don't understand sarcasm. <laughs> Chapter 48, and then uh, verse 2. So, and one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son cometh unto thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat upon the bed. And Jacob said unto Joseph, God Almighty appeared unto me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. So uh, one went to Jacob and told him, Hey, your son Joseph's coming to you. So Israel, he mustered up his strength so that he could sit on his bed. Because he's very ill, and he's going to die any moment. Verse 3, Jacob, he says to Joseph, Hey, uh, God Almighty, he appeared to me at Luz, at the land of Canaan, and he blessed me, and said unto me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, and I will make of thee a multitude of people, and will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. And now thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, which were born unto thee in the land of Egypt, before I came unto thee into Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. And thy issue, which thou begettest after them, shall be thine, and shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance. And as for me, when I came from Padet... Okay, now you notice how he's ranting. So when you... Uh, you'll understand when you go to a nursing home ministry, all right? <laughs> So then you're in, bed, uh, you're in bed all day, you know, you're bored, and there's a lot you want to say to your loved one. La, 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 yeah, all right. So that's what's going on. He's giving his whole life right here, all right? So let's just, uh, let's just pretend this is a nursing home ministry, all right? I didn't write these verses. If I had it my way, I'd chop off these verses. But uh, let's uh, give Jacob a break here, and let's hear his whole story, all right? So here we go, all right? Verse 7, And as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way, when yet there was but a little way to come unto Ephrath. And I buried her there in the way of Ephrath. The same is Bethlehem. Okay, so, uh, meaning, well, let me explain every word. I, I'll have to, okay? <laughs> is that, uh, I already explained his first part at verse 4. So verse 5, Jacob saying, So now your two boys, Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, and these are the boys that, got, that were born in Egypt before I myself came into Egypt. I want you to know they're like me. They're mine. So they're not considered to be Egyptians. They're considered to be Jews like me, he's saying. Just like how Reuben and Sibion are, uh, Ephraim, and Amasa, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh are to me. So Reuben and Sibion are his two firstborns, right? So then Joseph's two firstborns, or his only two boys, so to speak, 
match up with the two eldest positions here. So that's how Jacob's trying to explain to Joseph that's how special those two boys are to me, Ephraim and Manasseh. So uh, that, his issue is referring to his seed, obviously, Joseph's seed, that you were able to uh, have born after Ephraim and Manasseh, that seed after them is going to be yours, and they're also going to be called after the name of their brethren and their inheritance, meaning is that they're going to join the inheritance of their brethren, which is Jacob's other children, the Jews. So he's saying Ephraim and Manasseh is a part of that. And then Jacob continues at verse 7, as for me, when I came from the location Padan, Rachel, she just suddenly uh, died by me, you know, in the land of Canaan along the way. There was only a little way left to come to Ephrath. So I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, and that place is Bethlehem. Now, usually when you get up in years and you're talking a lot, the ones that you're going to talk or mention, even if it's not part of the topic, is someone that is a memory that is precious to you. So the scary thing that I want to tell you is this, okay? Uh, scary thing I want to tell you is when you get up in years, I wonder what's going to be the one that's most vivid or you're going to remember or feel the most and it's going to come out of your mouth. Right. Sometimes I fear what I could say out of my mouth when I get up in years. Uh, you know what I hope it will be? I hope it will be about Jesus Christ and my Bible-believing brethren and spiritual things that please the Lord. That's what I really hope for. Right? Rather than gossip about somebody you don't like from the past, from many moons ago. See, so, so you have to keep that. That's why it's so important you fix your life now. You keep, you keep saying, I'll fix it later, I'll fix it later. You've got to realize this. Even psychologists admit this. Children are the best years because that's still moldable. But when you turn adult, it's fixed and it's hard to change. And when you get old... You can't change even if you try because the way your brain and the body is already deteriorated and built. Good advice. Fix your life now. Repent. Live right for the Lord now. If you're young, better for you. All right? Keep it that way and don't stray away from your youth in growing up in the Lord. All right? That's strong advice. All right. Now, verse 8. And Israel beheld uh, Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? And Joseph said unto his father, They are my sons whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. So Israel, obviously, he sold, and he's uh, probably having a hard time seeing. So he uh, was able to get a glimpse or a look at Joseph's two sons, but he can't see us clearly, obviously. So that's why he asked, who are these? So Joseph responds to his dad, they're my boys that God gave me here in Egypt. So Jacob says, hey, uh, bring them over to me, I ask you, I request to me, so I can put a hand of blessing on them. So when he blesses them, verse 11, And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see thy face, and lo, God hath shown me also thy seed. And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself with his face to the earth. So Israel, uh, he says to Joseph, I thought that I would never see you again. I thought that I would never see you again. But uh, lo and behold, right here, God, he showed me uh, not just you, but your children as well. So that's God's grace and mercy on a backsliding deceiver. You'd be surprised how God can be very good to his children. He can be very good to you. All right? So, uh, there should be a fear of the Lord, don't get me wrong, but you shouldn't be that afraid of God if that makes any sense to you. All right? Uh, now, verse 12, uh, that phrase, between his knees, uh, it could mean, uh, I'm not too sure, but it's definitely a figure of speech right here where it can mean that uh, Joseph brought his sons. That's the idea, because this is his seed that came out from uh, between his knees, so to speak. That's where he was able to produce seed. Or it could be, where, uh, which I'm not too sure, because his boys are small. So then uh, they are like between him right here. So Joseph, he grabs his children and then spreads them out because he wants to put one of his children on Jacob's right hand and the other one on Jacob's left hand. So it could be that they're stuck over here. I mean, 
you know, if they're little kids, they're shy, this is grandpa, he's ranting, you know, and then you're like, you're like what's he talking about, you know, you know, so then father is trying to give them a little push, so he's probably doing that like that. It could be that way too, but I, but I don't know. After Joseph did that, he bowed himself and he put his face to the ground. So a lot of uh, people in the Orient, they do that. As a matter of fact, Koreans still do that. So every new year, uh, we have to do that. So, no, I'm not going to do it to you, all right? I, <laughs> all right, verse 13, verse 13. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. All right, so that's self-explanatory. Joseph takes his two boys, and then Ephraim is on Joseph's right hand. So he pushes him forward, and if he's pushing him forward, then if Jacob's sitting over here, then that would be Jacob's left hand, right? That when he puts his hand on Ephraim. Uh, let's see right here. Uh, yeah, it's Ephraim. And Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand. So Joseph takes Manasseh, who's in his left hand, pushes him toward Israel's right hand, brings him near to Jacob. Now look at verse 14, how Israel or Jacob response. Look, look at this guy, all right? this guy, his old nature, you know. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head. That's not where Joseph put it. Who was the younger? And his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly. So your wits, that means you're knowing, right? So he did this knowingly, or he did it deliberately. For Manasseh was the firstborn. Manasseh is the oldest. So Meaning that Israel, when he stretched out his right hand, he made sure to put it on Ephraim's head. So then he switched like this. Ephraim is the younger. He's not the older one. The right hand should go to the eldest. That's a common practice that you see throughout the Old Testament. We don't have to look at verses on that. We know that. Right of the firstborn is his. I mean, Jacob even knew that back at the book of Genesis where he deceived Esau for his birthright because he knows the eldest has that right. So see, Jacob, you know, he, his whole nature's kicking in, so he doesn't want to do it that way. So he puts his right hand on the younger person, Ephraim, and then his left hand on the older one, Manasseh. So he did it like this. Manasseh is supposed to be the oldest one. Ephraim's the younger. Verse 15, And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads and let my name be named on them in the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So then uh, Jacob, he blesses Joseph first, and then he says, uh, God, and this is the God whom my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, uh, walked before him. So notice right here that uh, walk right here can have a reference to spiritual walk. So if you want a verse on that, you can use this one, actually. So they walked before him. They had a good relationship with God, a good walk with God. Uh, it could mean uh, traveling too, but who knows. Anyways, uh, the next part is... Uh, He's describing God again, the God who fed me my entire life up to this day. And then he describes, notice right here, comma, right, the God. Yeah. He says, the angel which redeemed me from all evil. Yeah. How about that? So notice right here that this angel, which is capitalized, and there's a comma, is referring to God. So this angel redeemed, saved Jacob from all the evil. Yeah. And he says, may this angel of the Lord or God... Uh, bless, put his blessing on these young boys, the lads. Let my name be named on them. That's self-explanatory. And including the name of my forefathers, Abraham and Isaac. Let them increase into a huge multitude, okay, hu uh, large numbers in the, in the midst of the earth, in the middle of the earth. We're going to look at uh, the book of Acts. Book of Acts, chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Now, who spoke to Moses out of the burning bush? We know, right? It's the Lord, right? God Almighty. He said, I am that I am. I mean, that's pretty plain right there. I am that I am. But notice what the Bible says when we look at Acts chapter 7 and verse 30. Acts chapter 7, verse 30. Now, Jews make a big deal. They, they do not believe New Testament. 
So then when we say Jesus is God, the Jews make a big deal, then you're making God into an image. Our God has no images. What about the angel? Yeah. Yep. See, they're totally dishonest right there. If they don't believe in a human uh, incarnation, then they weren't being honest with their scriptures or they didn't know about their scriptures. To be honest, a lot of them, believe it or not, don't really know their scriptures. Yeah, even, so, even some uh, rabbis. So, believe it or not, a lot of them don't know their Bible, which is very sad, actually, which is very sad. But anyway, notice in Acts 7, verse 30, And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, and what? Angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. So it's the angel of the Lord. And he is using the I am that I am statement in verse 32. Saying, I am the God of my fathers, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. How about that? All right, go back. Go back. So the angel of the Lord is referring to God Almighty himself. We've seen that in several passages. Verse 17, and when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him, and he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand upon his head. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, basically, in verse 17, Joseph saw that his dad put his right hand on Ephraim's head, and Ephraim's younger. So that displeased Joseph a lot. So he took his father's hand and removed it from Ephraim's head and placed it back on Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father at the same, same time, uh, basically, uh, don't do that, Dad. This is the firstborn. This is the eldest person. So he's probably trying to explain to his father, uh, you probably th saw the wrong person. You probably saw the wrong person. This is the first one right here. Make sure your right hand is on his head. And then verse 19, and his father refused and said, I know it, my son. I know it. He also shall become a people, but he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he. And his seed shall become a multitude of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he said, Ephraim before Manasseh. So uh, the father, Jacob, he refused to hear what Joseph was saying. And he said, look, I know, I know, my son. I know what I'm doing. I know. Uh, Manasseh will become a great pe people. He's going to be very great. He's going to be very blessed. But certainly the younger brother is going to be greater than him. Ephraim's going to be greater than Manasseh. So Ephraim... Uh, Ephraim's uh, seed, Ephraim's uh, people, will become a huge uh, number of nations. And then so Jacob blesses the two boys at that particular day. And he said, uh, in you, in you two boys, Israel uh, blesses you. God will make you, uh, will make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. So he made sure Ephraim is uh, higher than Manasseh, and he makes sure that, uh, that Ephraim and Manasseh, that God truly takes them and uses them for who they are and will make them and bless them for who they are with an increase. That's the idea. Verse 21, And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God shall be with you and bring you again unto the land of your fathers. Okay, so Israel says to Joseph, Egypt it must be a horrible place. He says, hey, I'm going to die, but don't worry. So it's like a comfort. God's going to be with you. And make sure you go back to the land of your forefathers, not Egypt. He's comforting him. Hey, don't worry. You're not going to die. And you're not going to be buried in Egypt. This is not where you're going to end. You're going to move to Egypt. You're going uh, to move to Canaan. You're going to be buried there. So <laughs> Egypt must have a negative connotation in the Bible. All right, verse 22. Here's the one I want to cover. This is very interesting. Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. One in the world. What is he talking about? <laughs> Maybe he got too old, so he's writing something he doesn't know what he's talking about. That would be easier, but no, I don't think so. So Jacob, he says right here, also, 
I have given to you. Uh, I made sure to give you a portion above your other brethren. And this portion, whatever it is, it's something that I took from the Amorite out of their hands. And I took it away with my sword and with my bow. So he conquered them, basically. He conquered them. Now, what does that mean and where did, when did that happen? So some scholars will claim that uh, they, always, uh, they always mess up. All right? They think they know Hebrew when they don't. So they look at the Hebrew word right here, and it's, uh, I think it, the Hebrew word for portion, or one of those words. But when they look at that, they're like, oh, it says Shechem. So the Hebrew word is Shechem. So they insist when they go back to Jacob's two boys uh, that slaughtered all of uh, Shechem's, uh, that territory, that land, when they were like wiping them all out, that Jacob conquered that and he took that land. Well, one, uh, they got a problem. Uh, they, th Jacob did not conquer and live in lands. He was a sojourner still. As a matter of fact, he was trying to run away from that location, if you recall. So they weren't really reading their Bibles. So one, Jacob's a sojourner. Okay, let me uh, come over here and then uh, clarify the misconceptions. So what is this? The sword and the bow that he took from the Amorite. So, you know what? I made a mistake. I'm going to draw this line again. <laughs> that way I can make a distinction, all right? So then, uh, what is the portion here? Here are some incorrect statements. One is they look up the word Shechem, but then just the word itself shows that uh, Jacob had nothing to do with that. Jacob avoided it. He didn't conquer. He didn't conquer it. He didn't keep it. He avoided it. Second, he's a sojourner. He's not a conqueror. So when he conquers a territory, he's not going to own that land. That's important to understand. Now, did, do they fight? Do they make conquests? Yeah, but they don't uh, live or take the territories and live there permanently. They're sojourners. As a matter of fact, this is uh, uh, pretty interesting. When you go to uh, some of the passages right here, let's look at uh, Luke 15. Luke 15. Luke 15. The idea is, when you look at Genesis chapter 48, it says, when I have given you a portion above your brethren. So, it's interesting that when people want to talk about Hebrew words, the Hebrew words, uh, which is Shechem, refers to shoulder. So, it refers to one shoulder above. So then, if it's synonymous with portion, or if it's distinguished, there's a connection. The connection is it's referring to a piece of goods, not territory or land. It's re referring to a piece of goods. An example right here is Luke chapter 15. In Luke chapter 15, verse 12, the parable, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of what? Goods. Goods. That falleth to me. So notice that our son wants to claim his inheritance, the portion. Notice Jacob here, he's trying to give the inheritance to the sons as well. Portion. So it, re it would refer to goods. So one shoulder above could be like that figure of speech. I think some people still use that phrase today, but the idea is like a, a substance or a level above of goods. Something like that. But anyways, when we see that portion here can refer to goods, now we have to figure out the Amorite, all right? When did this happen? So there is no record of that in the Bible. So when he conquered the Amorite with the sword and bow, there are two in theories that I have. So there are theories. They're not doctrines, all right? So don't hang me. Our job is to figure out, uh, figure out the answers to that verse, right? And not every answer will be solid. So then you're going to have to put it as a theory at times. So just trying to find answers here. All right. This Amorite that he took will be as follows. One theory is this. When you go to Hose uh, Hosea 
11, I think. Hosea 11. Hosea 11. Hosea chapter 11. It's interesting, if you know the history of your Bible, Abraham, when uh, he lived in the land of Canaan, that area is known to be the land of the Amorite. It is the land of the Amorite. So, where Jacob's uh, terrain lies, or his possessions would lie, would be an Amorite terrain, or an Amorite possession. So that's what we have to understand. Uh, one example, I don't know if this is the passage right here, is uh, Hosea chapter 11, and uh, no, that is not it, that is not it, that is not it. Okay, so since that is not it, I'll just simply say this. But the, the Bible talks about in a certain passage in Hosea, that the Jews, uh, where the Lord took them out of, was he specifically called it the land of the Amorite, singular. He, didn't include, he did not include any other Canaanite tribe, actually, or people. So he recognized that originally that's where Amorites mainly own or possessed is within that area. So the verses, I don't know, but you can find it yourself, I'm sure, later on. Two, it's two. I guess it was chapter two, verse 10. Hosea 2, verse 10, you said? Oh, Amos, not Hosea. That's why. It was Amos. I'm so sorry. All right, Amos chapter 2, verse 10. All right, let me read that quickly. Sorry about that. Amos 2.10. And I also I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the what? I'm all right, but singular. See that? Why is that? Remember, Abraham, he lived where? Mamre, the Amorite. So that's where his possession started. So originally, it was an Amorite area. So it could be, when we look at Genesis chapter 48, that Israel is talking about a prophetic reference here. Because he's giving his blessing on Ephraim and Manasseh, right? So this is a future. So he's saying, when I give you a portion of goods above the Jews, it's where I uh, took out or conquered from the Amorite with my sword and bow. Well, obviously, that never happened in his lifetime. It could be referring to his descendants who do that, from the Amorites. And then Ephraim and Manasseh, they get a portion of goods, or conquest goods, a higher level above than the brethren. Why do you say that? Because when he says, I have given you, that I took out of the Amorite with my sword and bow, he's connecting that with him as a nation. He puts his name in them, remember. He puts his name in them. Because notice right here, he said this several times. He said at verse, uh, let's see right here, yada, 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 yada. I am pretty tired today, so my eyes are not as strong as before. He said name. He said name, name. Literally said it that way. Mm. Uh, verse 16, there we go, verse 16. Let my name be named on them and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. See, that's what he did. He put his name, his descendants, in Ephraim and Manasseh. He also said at verse 20, In thee shall Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And he said Ephraim before Manasseh. So he's putting, he's connecting himself as a nation, uh, connecting uh, his name to Ephraim and Manasseh. So when verse 22, Jacob says, I took uh, the hand of the Amorite, he's referring to Ephraim and Manasseh's descendants because he puts his name through their children, through their descendants, through Ephraim and Manasseh. So that's possibility number one. Possibility two, which is interesting, and we'll close it here, is Genesis 14. Genesis chapter 14. If he took it out of the hand of the Amorite, he could be referring to uh, 
his own descendants himself. So this is something that I got from my descendants. So he includes I himself with his previous descendants. So Abraham. Now Abraham, it's very interesting. He did a conquest and he didn't take the land, he took the goods. And that included an Amorite territory. So look at right here in Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14, verse 7. So remember, there was a war going on. Four kings versus five kings. Genesis 14, verse 7. And they returned and came to En Mishpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazes on Tamar. So these uh, four kings conquered the Amorites and took their goods. Now look at verse uh, 11 these four kings, and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. So notice in their conquests, they take the goods of the people. So this was Sodom and Gomorrah, as well as the Amorites and a whole bunch of other nations and tribes and cities, all right? But we'll just concentrate on Sodom and the Amorite. Now when we jump down to verse... Uh, 21, 21, notice right here. And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, uh, give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. Now notice what Abraham said to the king of Sodom, not the Amorites. He says to Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, that I will not take anything that is what? Thine, Thine. Sodom. But he never mentioned about all the other nations, like the Amorites and those that uh, he conquered. Also notice right here, uh, Abram, he did take the goods when we look at verse 16. Verse 16. And he, uh, Abram, brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. So it's possible that Abram, through conquest of sword and bow, see that? was able to take the goods of the Amorite for himself. The only exception, it's interesting, so Amorites were scattered. Verse 13, Mamre the Amorite was the one that wasn't captured. And Abraham made sure to mention, make sure you return Mamre's goods. Amorite's good. Mamre the Amorite's good. But he didn't mention about all those other nations which included the other Amorite cities or area. So that's very interesting. But anyway, that's the theory right there. So we won't know until probably at the judgment seat of Christ. <laughs> Father God, we thank you so much for the truth of your word. Uh, and it, your book is very interesting. Help us to increase in knowledge of the scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>